I'm sending us live now. Good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, change this week, a, a Friday morning uh, briefing, uh, but we're really grateful that you're you're on the call. I'm joined by both deputy mayors, uh, Sir Richard Lees, Baroness Beverly Hughes. Uh, this is how this morning will work. I just will provide the normal overview of where we are uh, in Greater Manchester uh, with regard to um, number of cases uh, and all the statistics you're used to. Uh, so Richard uh, will then provide an update on test and trace. Uh, I'll then invite um, Bev to update on police and criminal justice matters. And then I will provide an update on, on transport uh, before we open up to your questions. So uh, I'll get straight into it. Um, to give you the picture that was presented to the uh, GM COVID emergency committee uh, with regard to the, the current position uh, on the virus in Greater Manchester, Overall, um, an improving picture in, in the same way we've seen things continuing to improve over over recent uh, recent weeks. Um, I'll just take you through some of the statistics. Um, obviously, every uh, single uh, death uh, is a tragedy and uh, we feel for all of the families concerned. But we can report this week 14 deaths in hospital in Greater Manchester, which is a lot lower uh, than where we were just uh, a few weeks ago. In fact, last week we saw 28 deaths, so that that is uh, very much uh, uh, better uh, better news. I want to give you a bigger picture on cases, so you can see how how this is uh, unfolding. Uh, this is new cases um, recorded in Greater Manchester, and this comes only from what we call Pillar One testing data, the local uh, testing data. Um, if I take you through the last month, um, and I'll try and do so slowly so people can take these statistics in. If we start with the week ending 24th of May, there were 488 uh, cases recorded across our 10 boroughs. 31st of May, 273. 7th of June, 224. 14th of June, 237. So what you will see there is a, a slight increase, but we would say that's a, a stable position at the moment with regard to cases. Um, and that's what the data is telling us as we begin to receive the Pillar 2 data as well. So they have been falling, they are now stable. So obviously we've got an eye on that, uh, but still the feeling is the overall picture is moving in the right direction. You can see that in some of the hospital statistics, 14 uh, daily admissions, uh, the last figure uh, given uh, to me for the middle of this week. Uh, that, of course, is, is down on what it was um, a few weeks ago. Uh, and a significant reduction in the number of people in intensive care. Uh, that has now fallen to 28 in Greater Manchester. Uh, other um, patients in hospitals with COVID uh, 489. So overall, we have 517 people in hospital with COVID in Greater Manchester. Uh, last week it was 534. If you go back a few weeks, you were over a thousand. So you can see that the change, the change there. Just lastly on um, care homes, I think the position in care homes reflects the position I just gave a moment ago on cases. It seems that we're in a fairly stable position in care homes. Uh, where we've seen levels of infection fall, but not continuing uh, to fall. So uh, at present, um, we have um, uh, around 15% of our care homes recording uh, one or more residents with COVID, and that was the same figure as last week. That accounts for 2% of all care home residents in Greater Manchester. Again, that was the same figure as, as last week. And over the course of the last week, nine more of our care homes reporting an outbreak uh, or a, a case. So I think you can get the picture there, broadly improving, uh, but obviously we have an eye on the situation with regard to new cases as we as we uh, see the easing of lockdown. That's something we'll be watching extremely carefully, as I'm sure you'd expect. So that takes us neatly now into, uh, into test and trace, and I'll hand over to Sir Richard. Okay, uh, uh, thanks uh, Andy and uh, good morning everybody. Um, 
clearly we're less than two weeks into a national test and trace uh, program so it's too early to uh, really have any meaningful statistics so although i'm i'm as fond of numbers as some of you are uh, i'm not going to give you any uh, uh, today because i don't i don't think there are uh, any useful ones to give but what i can say is that uh, we now have uh, in all 10 districts in greater manchester uh, effective uh, test and trace operations up and running uh, staffed by uh, people who, who have the skills have the knowledge have the experience of working in, in test and trace and to the extent to which we've had uh, outbreaks and we've had nothing serious over the last couple of weeks uh, that that they have all been contained and managed uh, very uh, effectively so uh, from that point of view it is working in greater manchester although uh, this is led in each individual local authority by the uh, director of public health uh, because of the arrangements we have in Greater Manchester, we are able to be able to provide them support through the system, and, and that includes some of the data support there, and also to offer mutual aid. So if one district uh, has uh, is overburdened, it's the ability to help across the system, which is something we've been doing for the whole of the uh, last, last three months. So uh, in general, that is going very, very well. Uh, we think there are still flaws in the system. And, uh, we are beginning to get what's called pillar two, the national testing data. Uh, now we've still not got it fully, uh, and that's a flaw in the uh, system. We are expecting to get it, it is being uh, promised and it's slowly happening. But the other thing we'd want to do in Greater Manchester is to have full control over the pillar two testing and the, the national testing, as well as the testing that takes place in hospitals and health settings. And the reason we want to do that is that to the extent that we do have to contain any outbreaks, that as well as knowing where they're taking place, which is getting the test results, uh, then we also want to be able to direct testing so that we are uh, able to target testing where it is needed most at any on any particular uh, occasion. Uh, I and colleagues had a meeting with Dido Harding, Baroness Harding, who, who leads the national programme. Uh, earlier this week and um, we put a number of proposals on the table including uh, that because I think if we get it right in Greater Manchester uh, that would be a test bed to be able to improve the national system as well. And I'd say it's a very constructive uh, discussion and now there is work taking place between officials from Greater Manchester uh, and a national level to see if we could develop that uh, develop that further. Uh, I don't think there's anything I'd want further I'd want to add at, uh, at, at the moment uh, other than perhaps make uh, one comment on the uh, the app the app that was uh, tested in the Isle of uh, Wight apart from uh, the obvious thing that it didn't seem to work very well uh, but I think there's something else that came out of it that got nothing to do with the effectiveness of the app which was a lot of feedback from people in the Isle of Wight is that they didn't like getting a text telling them what to do uh, that really what they expected was if there was an issue that they would get a phone call and maybe somebody would explain what the uh, issue was rather than the text approach and I think that goes very much with what we've been uh, putting together in Greater Manchester it's to make sure there is that direct contact uh, people that they they can speak to somebody and get an explanation and it goes back to what we've said about uh, the approach of uh, inform and advise uh, if if you do that if we do it properly and I think that's what we are doing then you get very very high levels of compliance and again as far as we can see in Greater Manchester uh, people who have been asked to self-isolate there is a very, very high percentage so far. Uh, I said I wasn't going to give any figures, but it's very high percentage of people who are saying they will comply with that. Thanks, uh, Richard. Uh, now, Beth. Thank you very much, Andy. Um, well, just really a brief uh, report. Firstly, to say that we took to the emergency committee this week um, information about situation we've been dealing with uh, in the magistrates and the Crown Courts uh, right across the, the justice system. Obviously, of most concern is the criminal justice system, but there are issues as well in the family courts and in the civil courts arising from the demands of social distancing, particularly, um, but also in relation to the criminal process, of course, 
um, trials, Crown Court trials have been suspended by the government from the start of lockdown until um, the middle of May. Uh, and that has led to a very significant and growing um, backlog of cases that need to go through both the magistrates and uh, the Crown Courts. Um, working with the police and the chief prosecutor and the uh, court service, we have put together a, a task force which has put a, a plan in place with several important work streams and we will be on top of that. But it is a situation I wanted to bring to the attention of leaders and chief executives because obviously there will be some quite serious cases in that backlog, trials waiting to go to court. Uh, and I think we all need to be mindful that there are victims and witnesses uh, involved in that. The second, I think, point to say is that demand across the police service anyway has stabilised uh, over this week. Uh, it's growing still, but it's stabilised after uh, an unprecedentedly high demand over last weekend. I think that uh, people are now aware of, particularly Saturday night going into uh, Sunday morning. Uh, very high demand from the public for assistance, a 50% increase in 999 calls, a nearly 100% increase in 101. And behind those calls were some very, very a large number of very, very serious incidents that uh, residents in, in our communities uh, were needing assistance with. Very serious domestic assaults, um, unexplained death of, of two young children, knife robbery by a 13 year old and by the end of uh, the end of that period in early hours of Sunday morning there were 76 people locked up in police cells over Greater Manchester. At the same time as that was happening of course uh, the police and the ambulance service were called to those two raves that took place at that time drawing resources away from those really serious incidents that our residents were dealing with to having to make sure that those events illegal unregulated events were contained and that is why um, we produced uh, in consultation with leaders of councils across Greater Manchester a multi-agency plan uh, for this weekend and beyond in which we will try to prevent any of those uh, events taking place again and um, make sure that if they do, we will pursue those people behind it. So the, a detailed plan, it goes right across all the agencies, not just the police, although obviously they're an important element in that central, but also our local authorities uh, and our other partners. Yeah. Focused on intelligence gathering and trying to prevent the start of those events, because that is the most critical uh, point in the process to try and stop them happening. And calling on the public, uh, to pass information about events uh, that they that they come across because one of the difficulties for the police one of the big challenges is that the organizers try to keep the location of those events secret as long as possible so it's really helpful to the police to try and get on the front foot if they know where things are happening uh, to put their presence there at an early stage and deter and prevent people from congregating but it also includes uh, much higher uh, enforcement, uh, big clarification about the powers under the existing law that can be used to confiscate uh, equipment and will be overseen not only by the policing resources at the district levels in the local authorities, but by a silver command structure to make sure we've got the right coordination in place, that the intelligence flows as it should and can inform the action that needs to be taken. So we had a press conference on that yesterday and went into all that detail. So I'm not going to say any more on that, Andy, uh, just in case some uh, people were here today that weren't able to attend yesterday, just wanted to reference that plan this morning. Thank you. Thanks very much indeed, Beth. So just then to provide um, a transport update, it's obviously been a big week on uh, the transport system in Greater Manchester with the reopening of non-essential retail uh, on Monday. Um, I um, also um, wanted just to provide you with some figures on um, the uh, issue of face coverings, because of course, uh, as well as seeing the reopening of, of retail, uh, the new requirement to wear face covering on public transport also uh, came in on Monday. Um, we're pleased to report high levels of compliance with the new requirement, uh, particularly on Metrolink. So the figure I, I can give you is across all lines, 
we've seen 90% compliance uh, during the morning at peak. A um, bit lower on uh, the Alderman Rochdale line, but nevertheless still still high, which uh, is is a fantastic thing to report, to be honest. And it shows again how the, the public in Greater Manchester are listening to the messages, doing the right thing to protect themselves and each other. And it's uh, good to be able to report that. Just one thing to say, there is a tapering uh, in the evening uh, hours in terms of the numbers of people wearing uh, face coverings. So we will uh, want to be reinforcing the message that it's not optional. Uh, and with that in mind, we have uh, now changed the uh, conditions uh, of use of the system, which means that people refuse uh, to put on a face covering before they board a tram or refuse to leave a tram if they're not wearing one could be liable to a hundred pound fine. Now, of course, that's a last resort, but it is important that there is um, uh, enforcement. Uh, and this is now a clear position that, uh, that Greater Manchester uh, Travel Unit Officers, Greater Manchester Police Travel Unit Officers, uh, British Transport Police and our own Travel Safe staff will be able to, to, to use to ensure we, we get compliance uh, even higher still. Just one thing to mention on this, because there obviously are uh, people who for health or disability reasons uh, uh, do not wish uh, to wear a face mask and we very much want to ensure that they uh, are reassured uh, that, that they don't have to uh, and that they can continue to use the public uh, transport system. So as of today, uh, people can contact uh, TFGM uh, customer service staff by phone or email to order a new card and that card uh, will be able to be produced when on public transport to show that people have a justifiable reason not to be wearing a face covering. And we hope that will uh, reassure um, disabled people uh, and others who have a good reason not to wear a face mask, uh, that they are still completely uh, free to travel. Just um, a few statistics on where we are with transport more, more broadly in terms of usage of the system. Obviously, we continue to say that public transport is for those who really need it. And if you uh, can, you should uh, walk, uh, cycle or if you have to drive um, to leave public transport for those who've no other uh, alternative. Um, I have to say with the figures I'm about to give you, this represents the fact that the transport system is already pretty much at capacity, given the reduced capacity with social distancing requirements. Over the last week, just to give you the figures, we've seen a 14% rise in bus uh, patronage, a 20% rise on Metrolink, 15% uh, rise in footfall at Manchester Piccadilly, 7% increase in the number of cars on, on the highway network, and a 6% increase in cycling. Uh, so, you know, a, a big increase uh, over the course of the last uh, week. And as a result of that, um, we have a situation now where 6% of our trams uh, aren't able to follow the social distancing requirements given the number of people on. Uh, but as I've said to you before, we are moving to a 10 minute service with double trams from Monday and we believe that will uh, significantly uh, ameliorate the, the situation. So that is the, um, the, the latest position with regard to the transport system. And of course, it will remain an extremely uh, challenging time for, for public transport. But of course, it might also be an opportunity to accelerate the reform of uh, public transport and particularly buses that, as you know, Greater Manchester has been talking about for some time. So there's just one final thing I wanted to update you on uh, this morning, and that is the publication of a report that will go to the Greater Manchester Combined Authority meeting a week today on the outcome of the public consultation on proposals to introduce a franchising scheme in Greater Manchester uh, under the Bus Services Act uh, 2017. And that, that was uh, carried out in uh, the early part of this uh, year. Uh, and the responses to that consultation have been being assessed by TFGM uh, with support from uh, MORI, the uh, opinion polling uh, company. And I um, just wanted to report the conclusions of that uh, to you. Uh, more than 8,500 uh, businesses, organisations uh, and individuals uh, replied to that uh, consultation. Of those 
uh, people, uh, 5,978 who answered the question on whether they supported or opposed the proposed bus franchising scheme. 83% said they supported the proposed scheme. 8% of respondents said they opposed the proposed scheme with the remaining respondents neither supporting nor, nor opposing. Um, of course, though, the world has changed since the consultation was done and further work now needs to be done to assess the impact of coronavirus on uh, Greater Manchester's uh, bus market and that, that work uh, will be done. So uh, there are uh, no decisions uh, reached, more work uh, needed uh, to be done, but we believe the response to the consultation reveals uh, a frustration from the Greater Manchester public at a fractured system of different operators, uh, different prices, disjointed uh, timetables and uh, I think there appears to be a, a desire for a more integrated system. However, that is achieved under the options that are available in the Bus Services Act 2017. We are of course the first city region uh, to, use, um, to use that uh, act and we're committed to delivering a bus service that's integrated, fully accessible for everybody uh, and of course uh, affordable as well. So wanted to update you all on that. That concludes our updates, uh, Ross, um, and I think this is the moment to open up to questions. Thanks very much, Andy. I'm going to go to Rob Smith um, from ITV News. I'll we'll give it to you initially, but I think Bev and Richard may want to come in on this as well. Uh, Rob's question is, is it fair to say politicians, including you, have been slow to respond to racial inequalities here in Greater Manchester? And given the lack of senior leadership roles across the city, how committed are you to real change going forward? I, I don't think it's it's fair uh, to say that you know we we have ignored this uh, uh, question, uh, Ross, uh, Rob. Sorry, um, because Greater Manchester has a long and proud history of fighting uh, racial discrimination. Um, it goes back many years, uh, decades, uh, in fact. Um, but we can't be complacent, and we aren't complacent. Um, we began to put forward proposals earlier this year for a race equality panel, recognising that there is still much further to go when we look at the health inequalities that have been apparent during this pandemic, or indeed the way in which uh, different communities experience different treatment uh, at the hands of the, the police. You know, we've recognised those issues and it's why we wanted to bring forward a, a race equality panel. And uh, this time next week, uh, the Greater Manchester Combined Authority, we hope will be endorsing uh, a plan to, to put that into effect. It, that said, I don't want this to come across as though I'm, you know, oh, we've all done everything right. You know, of, of course we need to, to challenge ourselves and we are challenging uh, our, ourselves. I, I don't think we're slow because we it's always a part of our discussions in, in everything that we do in Greater Manchester. But, as, but uh, there is more uh, that we can do and what you have in the commitment to establish a race equality panel is a uh, a unanimous commitment from the 10 leaders and myself to say look you know there is more to do here to challenge ourselves to go further to tackle those inequalities in health in education in policing uh, and that's the commitment that we're that we're making i don't think we've been slow but but probably we need to do more and that's the commitment that we're making richard and um, what's to come in on this one uh, yes, if if I can, um, <clears throat> and first of all, that if I take it from a Manchester point of view, we've had probably a, a forty-year-plus commitment to uh, tackling racial in inequality, to uh, tackling discrimination, and it's not a complete uh, litany of failure. So, if I take the city council itself, uh, there are. We're at far more black employees than there were. Uh, there's a, a, as a proportion of the overall population, uh, it's more representative. Uh, our young people, by and large, until at least the last few months, have been, have been doing better in schools and more progressing. So it, it's not a complete failure. However, uh, it is still undoubtedly uh, the case that if you look in senior roles, uh, that black people are underrepresented. And it's also equally the case, it's quite clear that there is still discrimination in this country on the basis of the colour of people's skin. So uh, this this is not uh, nowhere near a job done. 
uh, it took, it was being slow to react and say that long before uh, the, the current issues around Black Lives Matters uh, blew up. Last year, we commissioned a report, an independent report, uh, to look at how, how uh, black staff were progressing or not progressing within uh, the city council. It's quite a critical report, I have to say, um, and we're doing something about it. So we have put in place now arrangements to look at change the way we interview for uh, senior posts to make sure we can put development plans in to support individuals to be able to develop the skills and make, uh, and make progress this is stuff that uh, was already in place that we were already uh, already doing I think one of the big things that's for me that's come out of the uh, last few weeks is a, a very clear recognition uh, that there has been a tendency to uh, lump all uh, uh, ethnic groupings uh, together so the use of BAME as an acronym it kind of treats black Asian and minority ethnic people as if they were all the same and I think one of the lessons we have to learn from this is that we have to uh, recognize we always celebrate the diversity of our city and uh, let's recognize it in the way we work here uh, as well and, and make sure we, we have far more uh, tailored approaches to dealing with the very many different uh, communities we have with it. Uh, the last thing I'll say about uh, senior leadership, whilst it's true within our uh, officer leadership within the senior council, uh, of my uh, council executive, which is uh, nine people, three of those nine come from black, Asian, or minority ethnic uh, uh, communities. So, uh, in the political sphere, that we've made a bit of progress, we need to make progress elsewhere. Thanks, Richard. Bev, would you like to come in uh, on this one? Thank you. Uh, just a quick comment. I think. I think we feel, and this reflects Andy's view and mine, that we've we've not been uh, behind the curve because we're very conscious of what actually comes from a strong political commitment, and and of trying how to have processes in place um, that do support uh, the opportunity to people from minority ethnic ethnic groups. And so, in the police, for instance, there's been. A revolution really in their recruitment processes that has led to a doubling from uh, just under five to just under nine percent uh, recruitment in the last three years since we've been here uh, of people at to police officer level at um, from black and minority ethnic groups however i th i do think i i would agree that we have perhaps not been as focused as we ought to have been on some of the outcomes we want to achieve. So we've been very committed in terms of the processes, but when you look at the big picture, um, as Councillor Lisa has said, you know, then we do have far too few people from minority ethnic groups um, in the senior leadership positions, which throughout our organisation, and this is a systemic issue right across the country, um, uh, we have too few uh, black and minority ethnic people in those senior sit leadership positions at executive level where their lived experience can really inform the development of policy uh, and practice and, and that is something that I, I, I will uh, I would I would take on board but the commitment and the drive and the attempt to improve the situation is certainly very much a feature of what we're trying to do here. Thanks, Bev. I'm uh, going to go to a uh, question from Michael Gaffney at Heart and Smooth Radio. We'll go to uh, you first, Andy, on it, and then to, uh, bring in Sir Richard. Um, Michael says one of our reporters was out with um, homeless outreach groups in the city centre last night. They're already seeing an increase in rough sleeping ahead of the coronavirus overnight provision finishing at the end of this month. Could we end up going back to square one on rough sleeping? And what are you doing to ensure phase three of a bed every night will hit the ground running? Thank you, Michael, and uh, thank you uh, for taking an interest in this crucially important uh, subject. So a few weeks ago, we warned uh, the government that there was a real uh, kind of challenge coming at the end of June as the everyone in uh, scheme uh, was wound down and we, we, we helped people move on to other accommodation. Uh, they dismissed that at the time, and I think they were wrong to do that because there is a real issue here that needs to be addressed. You know. At the start of the uh, crisis, we thought we would need to support around a thousand people in hotels and apartments. In the end, that number has been 2000. And I think what probably nobody anticipated is how many people would be made homeless by lockdown because of a breakdown in sofa surfing arrangements, financial hardship, 
a uh, whole range of whole range of reasons. So this is a very challenging uh, situation indeed. And I think we need more urgency, uh, both uh, amongst ourselves, but from the government in terms of addressing this so that we do achieve a lasting legacy from uh, from this um, situation where people have been brought inside. So we feel we're doing our part of the bargain at Michael. The combined authority uh, recently signed off a plan for phase three of a bed every night to start in the early uh, days of July. Um, this was with support of the NHS in Greater Manchester. You know, this is funding that we're putting forward ourselves. You know, this is voluntary uh, provided uh, funding from our public bodies through the Greater Manchester Mayor's Charity and other, other sources, uh, 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 the Deputy Mayor's Office as well, the Police and Crime uh, Commissioner's budget. We've put forward funding to get a bed every night going again in a modified form uh, that's COVID safe. Uh, and that will provide some 450 uh, places uh, for people. But it, it doesn't match the number of people who are still in uh, temporary accommodation. Uh, in hotels or apartments that that is closer to 800 and <clears throat> so we have um, put a bid in via Dame Louise Casey to say look the government has to work in partnership with us if it, if we are to uh, make this a a, um, uh, a successful outcome and a bid has gone in from mm -hmm. Greater Manchester uh, for around five million pounds to support um, our ambitions to make uh, everyone in a success but this is the moment where the government needs to back up its words with with action. But we don't believe it has properly funded our local authorities to support uh, this this work. Um, it's a very challenging moment and we know that frontline staff working in homelessness are under considerable pressure uh, right now. This is the moment we need help. You know, there's not much time here. If we go much further forward from where we are today, the opportunity might slip between our fingers and we may see more people uh, going back out onto the streets, which would be a, a real, uh, a real uh, tragedy if that were to, were to happen. So the moment is now. I call on the Prime Minister and the government to work with us to create a lasting legacy on rough sleeping and homelessness uh, in Greater Manchester. We've played our part of the bargain. We found the funding. We've agreed it. We've put it in. We now need the government to do the same. Thanks, Andy. I will just see Richard on this. Well, I think the first thing I want to, the first thing I want to do is to uh, uh, pay tribute to our homelessness team and all the private sector partners that they, uh, voluntary sector partners rather that they uh, work with. They, they, I think they are absolutely doing a phenomenal job in almost impossible uh, circumstances. And uh, it, of the people that have been temporarily housed in uh, hotel accommodation. Uh, over the past few months and bear in mind this scheme comes to an end in a week and a half. Uh, they've been working very closely on an individual basis with uh, every person there to try and ensure that they've got the support they need and that they do move out into a per permanent solution rather than back into another uh, different temporary solution. So uh, all of that's uh, uh, going on and has been relatively successful. But I think as uh, Andy's indicated, we're facing a, a constant flow of new people. Uh, here and we do not have the resource in order to be able to uh, deal with that. Government is doing things that are likely to compound the problem. So uh, in the last week uh, they've brought uh, something like uh, uh, an extra couple of hundred uh, single asylum seekers into uh, Greater Manchester. Um, I, I look, I, I'm all in favour we need to accommodate and support asylum. Uh, seekers and that's the right thing to do but we know from past experience that uh, for these people when their case is determined they are evicted very very rapidly from the government provided provision and a lot of them uh, then end up on the uh, end on the street so a difficult problem is being compounded by I think inappropriate government action but the biggest government action is again uh, one that Andy's referred to we've been talking to government now for weeks about additional resource, we've been promised additional resource uh, with a week and a half to go. It, it's still not there uh, yet and it, we really do need uh, government uh, supporters in developing, as Andy said, a, a real genuine long term solution to the issues that we face. Otherwise they are going to get worse. Thanks Richard. Uh, there's a 
a question from David Mooney at the Oldham Chronicle. It's quite specific, so you may not be able to go into specifics, but if you did have anything to say to it. Um, David asks, looking at care homes in Oldham, were patients in hospital with COVID discharged to the Chatterton Total Care Unit care home would have, there have been 30 deaths? Well, um, sorry, uh, David, I'm not able to answer uh, that question. It is a, a, a level of detail. Uh, and, and clearly, I, I think that's probably a question that's best addressed to the director of public health in Oldham, actually, rather than rather than to us. So I suggest you go there. Thanks, Richard. Um, to get a question from uh, Michael Gaffney uh, for Andy. Uh, in the past few minutes, the UK's chief medical officers have recommended we move to alert level three, meaning more easing of restrictions. Do you have any thoughts on that? And I'll bring in Richard uh, after you, Andy. Um, so uh, thank you, Michael. As I understand the way the alert level uh, system works, it, it says that level three is where the virus is in general circulation. Uh, it's not in a position where we're seeing you know, rapid rises in, in cases. That would be level four. So on the figures I gave to you at the start of this um, of this uh, press briefing, I think you could say that those figures probably reflect uh, a virus in general circulation. So. Uh, I, I wouldn't necessarily disagree uh, with this uh, decision. What what I would have concerns about is how it's interpreted uh, by people, uh, and in and also concerns about how the general management so far of the easing of lockdown has has proceeded. I, I think we we have got to reinsert into people's minds the need for a cautious uh, approach, a safety first approach to release from lockdown. That's what we've done in Greater Manchester. You know, we we we, uh, we talked of uh, reopening safely, and it's why we've been handing out masks on Metrolink uh, this week to reinforce that safety message at all at all times. Um, so while I wouldn't necessarily disagree with this decision, I, I think uh, if I were the government, I would be re-emphasising now the need for vigilance, for safety. There is still a considerable burden of disease. Uh, on coronavirus in Greater Manchester, as I, as I said uh, before. And uh, while, yes, we, it is the moment to, to, to ease things up and to get, begin to get back to normal, but, but do that with safety, uh, a safety first approach and, and vigilance at all times. Thanks, Andy. R uh, Richard, do you have anything you want to see on this one? Yep. Uh, well, I, I think a couple of things to add, and it's a reminder really, is that for uh, COVID-19, as yet, there is no vaccine uh, and there is no cure. And apparently, we found one drug that does have a positive impact for those people who are, require respiratory uh, uh, support. But whilst we have no vaccine and, and no cure, then the virus is likely to continue. Uh, we've seen most recently in uh, Beijing, just before that in Germany, where there have been spikes in uh, other other countries, we need to learn from that. So, one that Andy's given is is not alarmist in any way. It reflects what is happening elsewhere in the uh, world, and we need to take notice uh, of, of that and continue to be careful going forward. And it, in terms of the stable position we've reached, it, it may be that uh, we've now until we get a vaccine or a cure or the virus uh, fades away of its own uh, device because that happens occasionally uh, as well. May, we may well be uh, bumping along the bottom and this number of cases continues and whilst again that's the case there is the risk of getting a spike so it, it seems to be a sensible measure but it's a sensible measure as long as it's implemented in a sensible way. Thanks, Richard. I'm going to go to uh, Andy and uh, a question from David at the Oldham Chronicle. Uh, they've spoken to people in their region who say that bus drivers haven't been wearing face masks. Should bus drivers be obliged to wear them as passengers are and why are they not currently? Thanks, David. Um, the government guidance uh, does not require um, transport uh, staff to wear uh, face coverings. Um, I think the reason for that is that in some cases um, drivers say it can affect their ability to um, to, to drive uh, the vehicle. Uh, so that's one reason. Another reason is, of course, drivers tend to be um, closed off behind a screen in the cab. Not always the case, but in the vast majority of cases is, is the case. And I think that is the reason uh, why 
um, they have not been uh, required to wear masks as passengers have been required uh, to wear masks. So um, that's the position. I do think it probably should be kept under under review because um, obviously the layout of different uh, uh, buses and trams, uh, well, buses more uh, varies. Uh, and you know we want to ensure that uh, we build confidence and we have that safety first culture in everything that we do. But um, that's the, the current guidance. Um, and I think we need to to go with that for now, but but possibly keep it uh, keep it under review. Uh, thanks. Uh, staying with transport, Ian Hills at Withenshaw FM asks, and um, with a big investment by councils, uh, in addition to help from central government in providing cycle lanes, should cyclists make a financial contribution towards the cost? Uh, he's personally not in favour of a licence, but a public liability insurance scheme with a levy to go to councils to help the costs. Um, oh, a tax on cyclists. Uh, now there's one, uh, Ian, that you're tempting me, uh, tempting me down. Uh, and uh, I certainly would be getting a call from a certain Mr. Chris Boardman if I were to uh, uh, to uh, to go with the, your question. I mean, I, I think not in that, you know, this is about helping people get around as cheaply and as, as easily as, as possible and recognising that cyclists do least uh, damage uh, with pedestrians to to roads. Um, and you know, recognising the pressures on people at the moment, um, I would say, um, you know, let's let's encourage people to be active. You know, when you're cycling, you you aren't just kind of helping reduce congestion. You're helping improve the the air. You're you're keeping healthier, which is a benefit to everybody. So you know, it, it, I think we should be encouraging it um, rather than sort of give, creating disincentives to to to, to cycle. Uh, and you know, that's the way I would prefer to go. We, we put in, a, you talk about the money, we've um, put in a 21.5 million bid for emergency active travel measures and hoping to hear very soon actually from the government on that. So, you know, I, I think this is a moment to create incentives for people to, to walk, to cycle, and that's what we're working with our 10 boroughs on. So I, I wouldn't personally go on the, 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 the path of a license insurance or, uh, or costs. Richard, did you have any uh, views on this one? I probably need to declare an interest as a cy uh, cyclist, but uh, um, uh, I, I, I think we probably, I, I don't agree with the license and I, I agree with what uh, Andy said about we want to encourage people to uh, take more a uh, active and healthy ways of getting around and uh, um, particularly around w walking. Uh, in terms of insurance, it's probably just worth looking at the uh, uh, the accident statistics that involve uh, are caused by cycles and see see what that is because I think there is a real danger we're talking about a sledgehammer to crack a knot. So uh, my first, uh, I think my first uh, way of looking at this would be to, what does the data say? Let, let's start to invent a solution where there is not actually a big problem. Uh, thanks, Richard. Um, Andy, a question from uh, Nigel Barlow about Manchester, uh, again on public transport. He's saying uh, with our public transport coming close to capacity under current social distancing rules and given that it's now mandatory to wear face coverings, is it not time to review the two metre rule on trams and buses and start to get people out of their cars and back on public transport? Uh, how long can we expect central government to continue to fund the loss making services? It's a good question, uh, Nigel, uh, and I think it is being reviewed, isn't it, by by the government? I think the um, the reduction in the alert level uh, from four to three, I think, creates extra um, freedom for the government to act in this in this area. But I think they're right to have said they'll be guided by the science. Now, I know the science uh, can be um, contradictory in this uh, in, in this space, but. I, I think they've been right to, to maintain a discipline around the, the two metre. And, and I, I, I would just personally ex advise a little bit of caution in changing it because the public understand it and they understand it very clearly. And um, even so, it probably doesn't always translate to two metres when people are out and about uh, in supermarkets or on, or on public transport, as, as we've said. So, you know, while I understand uh, why people want to just get more people on the buses and trams and you know just get back to normal i understand that impulse as i said before 
we've got to be careful that we don't just think, oh, we're all just, you know, things are changing. We're just getting back to normal. Safety first has got to be the way we approach uh, this. Um, and, you know, I, th I think caution is, is the right approach uh, when it comes to making any changes. I think there has been a bit of confusion crept into people's minds around the, the government's advice. And I think, you know, if we were to sort of see a, an abrupt change to the two metre rule, I think it could could further increase that that, that confusion and, and weaken the, the discipline in public health messaging. So I understand what you're saying. To be honest, moving from two metres to one metre doesn't massively increase capacity on, on public uh, transport. It certainly brings a, a few more people back on and that will be helpful. But, um, you know, it, it doesn't completely open up uh, capacity again. As I said, we're going to double trams and a 10 minute service from Monday, so more capacity is coming. And I think that's probably a better way to go. On the bus um, uh, situation, I, I would say to the government, think about working with the coach industry that's currently kind of standing idle, you know, to bring put more vehicles on the road necessarily before you kind of leap to just changing, uh, changing the distancing rules. There's other ways of going about this. And I think extra capacity is probably the first thing to do. Thanks, Andy. Uh, Kim Fitzpatrick, uh, Radio Manchester. Um, it's got uh, uh, three uh, transport questions here, so I'll put them to you. Uh, bus reform, uh, what needs reassessing due to the virus and what implications does it have for the existing plan? And I'll bring Richard in on that as well. Also on clean air, is there any update on conversations with government on how this might change? And finally, on trains, you told the Commons Transport Committee um, about uh, trains uh, complaints about trains have all but disappeared do you expect capacity issues to resurface or has the virus tra changed train usage for good with more people at home good questions kevin maybe i'll allow richard to do more uh, question number one but but obviously there's a new reality that has come with with coronavirus and that has to be assessed in terms of how it might impact on the bus market uh, going forward will it be temporary or will there be a longer term change in, in bus uh, patronage, for instance. So uh, that, that's obviously got to be fully taken into account uh, before we can uh, can move forward with whatever decision uh, I, I end up making. On uh, clean air, I had a conversation with the Chancellor yesterday on this very topic because I think uh, this is a moment to accelerate ambitions around uh, clean air, not just in Greater Manchester, but across the country. So that means funding being provided, hopefully in the July fiscal statement, which is just a couple of weeks away, funding given uh, to uh, city regions like ours to uh, move decisively towards electric uh, buses, um, creating funds so that we help our taxi drivers switch to uh, zero emission vehicles, clean vans, Funding of this kind could actually be a help to business at a, a, a moment where they need help. So it could be both a scheme which helps clean up the air, which is the right thing to do, but provide some uh, some support to uh, taxi drivers and taxi companies who will have had a very difficult uh, few months uh, indeed. So I think this is the moment to clean up our, our air, to accelerate ambitions in, in, uh, in, in that regard. And I put that point very directly uh, to the uh, to the Chancellor uh, yesterday. On trains, it's true. My um, my morning Twitter has never been quieter when it comes to uh, the, uh, the, the the chaos on the railways. Actually, coronavirus has created a situation where uh, that that has brought stability to the railways because the number of services have dropped, and we've we've stopped trying to force too many trains through central Manchester. It's as simple as that. And I've said to um, to the Department for Transport, to Network Rail, and to the train operating companies. You know, please do not go back now to a situation where you reinstate all of the services and reinstate the chaos. Bring the trains back more gradually and, and, and keep some of these changes to the, to the timetable because, you know, we cannot have a situation where we're trying to manage trains at 10 or 20 percent capacity because of the face coverings and social distancing. And then if those trains are chaotic in terms of not arriving on time, then that will just be unmanageable. So I have said to them to bring it back slowly. Um, let's not return to chaos. And I, I have received some support from certainly the operator of Last Resort Northern for, for saying that that is their, in, their intention. And I have to say there's been a real positive change with regard to our engagement with uh, Northern as it is under the operator of Last Resort uh, since, since the uh, change earlier this year. And I have hope 
that some culture change is coming to our railways. Uh, there's much better engagement than we had before. And, and I hope we can keep some of the stability that we've seen in recent weeks. Thanks, Andy. Uh, before I bring Richard in on the bus uh, question, there's also another question from Kevin uh, for you, Richard. What do you make of the government's plan uh, and cash to help children catch up with their education uh, this summer and beyond? Uh, thanks for that, Kevin. I, I'm going to make a very quick comment on uh, uh, trains. Um, stray away from my brief, if, if, if you don't mind, which is that, uh, and it, it's to reinforce, I think, point that Andy's made is that we were promised eight years ago investment to reduce the congestion problems in the Castlefield corridor and the station. Um, for most of that we are still waiting and this seems to me as we go into this uh, economic recession where we're looking for shovel ready projects there's a shovel ready project for you about improving capacity in the Castlefield uh, corridor now is the time to do that. Uh, on bus reform, and clearly we, we've moved to uh, uh, a position where uh, in a deregulated system, we had a, a, a mixed economy of commercial routes with uh, publicly subsidised routes. Well, we've now moved to a position where uh, at the moment, I don't think we've got pretty much any commercial routes at all. It's nearly all entirely publicly uh, subsidised and that's likely to continue for uh, a period of time. So. It's had an impact on uh, usage of public transport. It's also had an impact on uh, how public transport is being funded. And those are things I think uh, we need to take into account in order to give uh, Andy advice about the decision he has, has to make, because they do make a material difference to uh, how public transport is likely to operate over the next, the next few years. And it is worth taking uh, a little bit of time, not to slow the process down, but again, to make sure that we get it right as far as we can. Uh, on the question about uh, uh, the government plan and cash to help children catch up with their education this summer and uh, beyond, uh, cash good, plan not so good. Uh, I think the short answer is that the, the last uh, few months and uh, we'll have uh, increase the divide in educational achievements, particularly for young people from uh, living in deprived neighbourhoods, uh, young people from uh, black, Asian and minority ethnic uh, uh, communities. And we, we do need to be investing uh, in the medium term to give all those children the opportunity to uh, uh, catch up. And that's absolutely vital. But that planning needs to be done at a local level. And we've taken an approach of working with our schools to put in place uh, plans to support children coming back into school. The same should apply to uh, catch up plans as well, that we need to work with those people who are delivering the services. Yes, they're vitally important that we have those services. It's vitally important that we get children back into school as soon as uh, uh, we can. We do need cash to do that, but the planning should be done at a local level rather than uh, nationally imposed plans. Thanks, Richard. Um, I'm going to go to Andy and a question from the Bolton News. Uh, is there anything being done to ensure high streets continue to be busy after a successful first week of reopening non-essential shops? And is any more support being given to independent businesses who may still be struggling? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Lyle. The um, uh, reopening safely campaign is obviously Greater Manchester's um, uh, effort to build confidence to get people back on, on the high street. So we've been working with businesses across Greater Manchester on that and we'll continue to, to do so. Is there any more support being provided to independent businesses? We were the ones who made the case to the government to expand the, the business rate support scheme that they had. That was providing grants to, to, to uh, companies that had a business rates registration. We successfully persuaded the government to open that up to more independent, smaller uh, businesses and that support has been provided uh, by our by our councils. So we recognise how tough uh, times are uh, for uh, for businesses. Um, we'll continue to work with them over over the coming uh, coming weeks. But uh, Councillor Elise Wilson, who leads on these matters for us, is a, a small business owner herself. Uh, fully understands uh, the pressures on small business, and you can assure uh, be assured that um, we'll be doing everything we can as as Greater Manchester looks to a. Uh, a recovery that uh, supports jobs and businesses across the city region. 
Thank you. I'm going to go uh, to a question from Adam at Roch Valley Radio uh, for you, Andy. Joe Anderson, the principal at Berry Grammar School, is hoping to run curriculum based days for the first time over the summer for year 10 and year 12 students who have exams next year. The school also wants to support pupils from state schools with catch up work if they're allowed to do so. Is this an idea you'd support? It is an idea I'd support. I'd very much build on what Sir Richard said a moment ago. Um, I think we really need to work hard uh, to um, to help young people in Greater Manchester this this summer. Um, I, I've been saying for a few weeks now that they are the ones who will experience the biggest um, uh, hit from coronavirus. The, the 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 damage and disruption to their lives is is pretty huge, and particularly those in years ten and twelve at those that crucial age. Um, you know, we we fully understand how difficult it is for them. So I would support. Uh, uh, Joe, uh, in, in doing that. We're in discussions with schools across Greater Manchester actually so that we, we might open up more schools across Greater Manchester for more than just curriculum days, maybe for sport and arts activity, maybe also to provide uh, a place where young people can go and get food, uh, supplementing uh, the, the, the voucher scheme that was so fantastically um, uh, won uh, by our very own Marcus Rashford this week. And I just want to say, say something about that. I think I'm sure I speak for everybody in Greater Manchester in saying it was just uh, such uh, a powerful personal campaign uh, that he led. And, you know, he gave a voice to so many young people that often probably will feel forgotten. And I just think about how they must have felt when they saw him out there making the case, winning the argument with the government, but doing it in a really dignified and constructive way. So I, I might be trying to make an offer to him. I'll, I'll go into talks with Ollie to make him our uh, government relations uh, advisor because there's a m number of other issues that we might pass to uh, to Marcus to go into to battle on our on our behalf. So, um, but really, I think every single person in Greater Manchester, red or blue, and, and I mean that in terms of politics and football, will have just been so uh, proud of Marcus Rashford uh, this this week and his family. The way he's put his argument, um, yeah, it, it was just just fantastic to watch. And I think we've kind of got to build on what he's been saying. The advocacy he's provided for kids who face the biggest challenges, we kind of got to build on that and not just provide vouchers. I'm sure Mark will be the first to, to, to agree. There's so much more we should be doing for those kids starting this summer. Speaking of Marcus Rashford, um, Hits Radio oh. um, are asking, <laughs> Um, after a successful week for Marcus Rashford, we're wondering if there are any plans to honour him. A few weeks ago, Bev Hughes spoke about nominating people who should be recognised with statues. Do you think Marcus should have a statue in Greater Manchester? So we go to you, Andy, first, then uh, to Richard, uh, and then uh, uh, finally to Bev. So if you get any thoughts as well, this will be the final question. Well, that's a, a statue we'd all defend, I think, wouldn't it? If we got it up, we'd all uh, we'd all defend it as well. Um, I'm not sure he's quite in, in statue uh, ter territory uh, yet, um, uh, but you know, as I say, I mean, I've just said what I said ab about uh, about Marcus. He's already been uh, honoured during this by the High Sheriff of Greater Manchester. I think it's important to say that. So we'd already recognised his work ourselves uh, a few weeks ago. I think Trafford Council um, have put forward uh, a suggestion that he might be given uh, the freedom uh, freedom of, of the borough. So, yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, as I say, we're so proud of him. We want to 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 support him in any way we can and recognise what he's achieved. And um, uh, I, I think uh, we'll all be watching closely tonight to see if he can take his off the pitch success onto it uh, as, as uh, Manchester United return to action tonight. So it's been a it's been a brilliant week for him, but I, I just think you know, we're lucky in Greater Manchester, just to say this, to have two football clubs that are increasingly making a difference, both in their own communities, but together. It's really noticeable to see how the, the clubs are working. I, I really watch these things and I, and I see it and I see the impact that they're making, particularly where they join forces. And I think in Marcus Rashford and Raheem Sterling, we have two of the most articulate, passionate, uh, incredible role models, I think, for, for young people. And we're very lucky to have them both here in Greater Manchester doing what they're, they're doing, not just on the pitch, but off it as well. And I want to say to both of them, please keep doing what you're doing because you're making a real difference to so many people, but particularly kids in Greater Manchester who look up to you. You are inspiring them. It's fantastic. Thanks, Ross. Thanks, Andy. I'll bring in Richard uh, on that point. Uh, and if you have any final uh, words as well. 
Well, I, I, I'm going to be uh, a, a little bit uh, parochial about tonight's game. and uh, <laughs> I, some, I know some journalists are obsessed with my uh, IM, but uh, as you look at it, if you look that way, uh, what you'll see is that Manchester City paraded the Premiership Trophy in front of uh, uh, Manchester Town Hall. Having said that, I agree with everything Andy said about uh, Marcus Rashford, uh, uh, that it's a fantastic achievement, and I think we ought to be celebrating that we do have this wonderful role model uh, within the city, similarly with uh, Raheem Sterling uh, as well. And I think we should be celebrating uh, that and using it in, in every way we can to in, encourage uh, other people to, uh, I, I think, uh, stand up for themselves and, uh, and follow their sort of example. Um, statues, which is the question. I think I'm moving. Normally in Manchester, you have to be dead to have a statue, and I don't think Marcus is anywhere near that uh, at, at, at the moment. Um, but I, I think I'm tempting to the viewers. We'd be better off if we had no statues at all. Then we wouldn't have any problems with them. So that, that's where <laughs> I think I'm going. Thanks, Richard. And a final word on this uh, and anything else uh, from Dev. I think I'm with Richard about statues. I think they're a very old fashioned way now, you know, kind of replicating people in stone. Uh, in the 21st century, surely there's more modern, vibrant ways of celebrating the contribution people have made. But as regards Marcus Rashford, I mean, Andy has said most powerfully um, everything that can be said about what he's done this week. Uh, and, and I associate myself entirely with those remarks and his sentiments. I think it's also probably worth noting as well that, you know, even before this week, he was quietly without any fanfare um, setting up a very substantial uh, voluntary organisation that's distributing food to people around our communities and showing, you know, his 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 really outstanding values uh, and, and leadership um, and his um, commitment to the people of, of Greater Manchester and particularly people who, like him, have, have not had the most advantaged start in life. And I just think it's it's a tremendous role model for everybody, but particularly young people uh, in, in Greater Manchester to, to witness. And I feel, too, uh, really proud of him. As regards final remarks, just to say anything you can do to get the message about, uh, about not going to anything that might be organised this weekend, the message about uh, the raves and what the police and local authority response will be, would be appreciated. I can see it's pouring with rain at the moment, but we don't know what the weather's going to be like uh, tomorrow. So that would be appreciated. Thank you. Thanks, Bev. We'll just go finally back to Andy. I think we're good, Ross. So um, thanks everybody uh, for for tuning in uh, again. Slightly over overrun the hour. Uh, a full update there today, as I'm sure you'll agree on lots of lots of issues. I'll just say it again, but it's worth saying because we appreciate the fact that you do tune in and you are reporting what we're trying to get over to the public. Um, it's uh, really helpful in what remain challenging times. We may be dropping an alert level today, but you know the message you've heard from all of us today is is vigilance, safety first, um, let's look after each other. Uh, and as Bev said, you know, don't go to uh, any unauthorised events where you might be putting yourself at risk and indeed bringing the virus back home to your family. That's the last thing you should be doing uh, right now. So with that, Ross, I think I'll draw today's event to a close and thank you all for, for attending. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you.